so far, I've mostly covered good games or mixed bag games. Well, here's a shitty game. Literally. Welcome to the Game Dungeon. Percy the Potty Pigeon is an arcade-style game originally made for the Commodore 64 that later got ported to the ZX Spectrum. The object of the game is to go around collecting twigs for your nest. Other birds will fly around and try to mess you up, and cars can run you over if you're not careful. If you complete your nest, then you go to the next level and the difficulty increases. But you can level the playing field, because as you may have guessed, you can take a crap at will. If you do that, other birds will leave you alone. And if you hit the car windshields, they'll swerve and get in a wreck. 20 points. Okay, listen. I'm normally not the biggest fan of toilet humor, but I'm making an exception here because I'm kind of amazed this game exists. I feel like this deserves special recognition because this actually got published in a box and was on a store shelf somewhere. Anyone can make a game like this. I'm sure some indie ones do today, but getting it on a store shelf? That's something kind of unique at this cross section in history. I mean, there have been outrageous old school games before this. Custer's Revenge is a notorious one, but that was marketed as an adult game. This was probably marketed for kids more than anyone, and why not? They would probably find a pigeon crapping on things hilarious. A lot of you probably know of the Nintendo's seal of approval. The idea behind it was the game had to hit certain criteria or else Nintendo wouldn't allow the game to be published on their console. Modern console makers do the same thing. If Sony or Microsoft or whoever doesn't approve of your game, you can't sell it for their system. Well, this was a PC game. There was nobody you had to answer to. You could do whatever you wanted. And that's exactly what Gremlin Graphics did. Gremlin Graphics. I mean, sure, the cover shows the pigeon dropping eggs, but the game is still named Potty Pigeon. I think everyone knew what was going on here. Their marketing people had enough sense to know that maybe they wouldn't sell as many copies if they had a close-up of a pigeon taking a shit on the cover. That can have something of a chilling effect on game sales. In fact, I was a little reluctant to even make this episode, since I was concerned of what people were going to think of the show if I did. I mean, I'll always stand by my opinions, but I think it's easy for people to get the wrong idea on this one. Like, a newcomer might be watching and think, oh great, another video game show about shitting on things. Thanks, internet. So not only could this episode drive off the people who are eating right now, but worse, I might start getting unexpected fans who start getting pissed when the next episode does not talk about shit. Because I know somebody is watching this right now and saying, Ross, this is nothing. What you need to be playing is Shitflinger 5000. Guys, I'm gonna say this now. You don't need to email me with a bunch of links to more scatological games that no doubt raise the bar for shit, please. Anyway, back to the game. What you see is pretty much what you get. You collect twigs, crap on things, and get points. Percy's living the dream. Though I have to talk about these controls because there's more here than meets the eye. I couldn't find a manual to the Commodore 64 version of this game, so I just had to guess what all the controls were until I figured it out. This took me longer than I thought, but here it is. Is this what you were expecting? You may want to take a minute to look at that. Now, you might think some of these buttons are for special moves, like fighting games. So Percy will launch a fireball out of his ass if you press the right combo. But no, this is exactly as impractical as it looks. If you press the up arrow, you move down and right and fire because um, now I am playing this on an emulator, since I haven't messed with the Commodore 64 in a long time, and their keyboards have functions that don't really exist on modern ones, so some translation weirdness is to be expected. But I tried this on three different emulators, and they all turned out the same. So let's make this authentic and take a look at what this would have really felt like on an original Commodore keyboard. Hey, look! It's still bullshit! Or bird shit, I guess. That's an awful lot of keys to try and fake you out. And honestly, this sort of thing wasn't that uncommon. If you ever bought a Commodore game from a yard sale or a thrift store with no manual, you could expect a similar experience of not knowing what the hell is happening. 
And if you did figure it out, all you could wonder was why. Maybe there was some weird hardware limitation I don't know about that made saying controls impossible. Like if you pressed A and Q, the system would catch on fire. I'm out of ideas as to what any other explanation would be. If I was a game developer, I personally wouldn't have 20 redundant keys along with multiple functions that don't help the player. But clearly, I'm not thinking outside the box the way the developer Anthony Crowther was. But hey, maybe this was just a better experience for the joystick. Well, let's take a look at the controls for Joystick 1. Huh. Again, not how I personally would have designed the controls, but what the hell do I know? And now let's look at Joystick 2. Ah, I think the developer was trying to tell us something here. Maybe Player 1 stole his woman. So problem solved, just use the second controller and everything's great, right? Well, no, our problems aren't over yet. Now, I admit, I may be at a disadvantage since I tried playing this on a gamepad since I don't currently have a joystick, but let me explain something about the handling. Moving up and down is relatively simple. You move up, as soon as you let go, you come to a complete stop. It's a little stiff, but what's more basic than that? Well, I'll tell you what's not more basic. Moving with Newtonian physics simulating a one-dimensional vacuum, because that's what the horizontal movement is in this game. If I move to the left or right, I maintain a constant velocity, forever. I'm not even touching the controls right now. In fact, the only way I can slow down is to increasingly push back in the other direction to counteract the force like I'm trying to perform a moon landing. You really have to hit this tiny dead zone to keep the bird still. It's so easy to just take off sideways. Compare the top speed for going up and down and the top speed for going left and right. So you have 100% friction on the Y axis and no friction on the X axis. I would say this feels like steering on ice except in the air, but the difference is with ice, you eventually come to a stop. If you have a flight stick with a throttle control, maybe you can get a handle on this. But if you're on a gamepad, good luck. Back to crazy ass keyboard for me. You know, I'd be better at this game if the hitbox for the nest wasn't so damn picky. I passed right through that. How does that not register? And this bird is riding my ass. If it touches me, the stick resets. What the hell? Come on! There, Jesus! Well, that's one. Only eight or nine more to go. So what about the rest of the game? Well, this is a good example of a game working within its limitations. The art style of this, I think, is pretty great given its age. This actually resembles the UK countryside, even though everyone drives on the right side of the road. You'd think Anthony would know that one since this was, you know, developed in the UK and he's British. But maybe I'm being too hard on him. Between this, the keyboard layout, and the Player 2 joystick, I'm starting to think he might be dyslexic and maybe left-handed. The music is generally nice, although it should be since it rips off a popular BBC show at the time, All Creatures Great and Small. Nobody really gave a shit about copyright law in games at the time. Nobody. Not even this game, which had more shit to give than any of them. Now as I mentioned earlier, this game was ported to the ZX Spectrum by a different programmer. But I don't want to talk too much about that one, since its color scheme burns my eyes. If anyone watching this is colorblind, this version of the game is essentially kryptonite for those of us who can see color. In 2004, there was a fan remake of the Spectrum version, and despite having a classy looking intro screen, I feel like it kind of misses the point. I mean, the cars explode when you crap on them. What kind of shit is that? To me, this version has it all wrong. It's too goofy and kid-like. The original had the right idea. Scenic English countryside, classy music playing, and bird shit everywhere. There's a message in there somewhere. I think Potty Pigeon has potential for a modern day remake, 
Especially if you had realistic traffic and collision physics and could cause multiple car wrecks. Now that technology's better, instead of having the cars disappear when you hit them, they could remain on screen and you could watch people get out of them and start screaming at each other while the calm music was playing. I would find that relaxing. When playing this, I can't help but imagine an alternate timeline where this game has more prominence. Like, I would argue Mario is the most recognizable video game figure of all time. Besides Super Mario being a good game, Nintendo has kept it alive as a franchise, and more importantly, it came with every purchase of a Nintendo. So the game was everywhere. Well, I try to imagine what if Potty Pigeon had become the game icon instead, so that gaming was changed by having dozens or hundreds of games related to shitting all over everything, and how that would have affected history. It would be strange. Like, there could be a real stigma today where somebody might say, Oh, you play video games. Ew. Some of you may have heard of the video game crash of 1983 that caused video games to almost die from 83 to 85. Well, that actually didn't affect PC games that much, like the Commodore 64. If anything, they were thriving during that time. Potty Pigeon came out in the thick of that crash, and the company went on to make more games. Gremlin graphics. So PC gaming survived because it was making games about birds shitting on cars. And that was money in the bank. Now I don't know if this game has an end, or if you just go on until you inevitably die. A lot of games back then like to remind you of your own fatalism. I could only make it to level 3, mostly because of the damn hit detection. But there they add airplanes and dogs to try and kill you. However, in the attract mode, you see snakes and balloons added to the mix. There could be more out there. If it's anything like the Spectrum copy, you might have Russian paratroopers and space aliens later on. Who knows? This did come out the same year as Red Dawn. All in all, this is a hard game and definitely has a challenge, but it's extremely grindy since the whole thing is just a big fetch quest. I can't really get into it for more than a few minutes. And that's true of most arcade style games with me. The substance just isn't there. So I don't plan on covering many on the show, but this one stool, I mean, stood out. There's no shortage of shitty games out there, but when you double down on the shit and start throwing it everywhere, people can notice. I've heard this game described before as the world's first shit em up, and I can't argue with that. That's it! Stay tuned for the next episode, which will be not of this world. And shit free. <laughs>